الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم everyone in this video i am going to be reacting to a video made by reasoned answers titled a hundred reasons why islam is false and basically what i'm going to do is that i'm going to debunk all of these reasons one by one i don't think i have seen any muslim debunk all of these reasons the best i have seen is a guy a muslim only refute some of these reasons so i guess i would be the first ever muslim to refute all of these reasons in one video and this is actually very important because many muslims especially young muslims are being misguided and deceived by people like reasoned answers who make these type of islamophobic videos so yes i am going to be refuting all of these reasons from number 1 to number 100 so without further ado let's start today's video hope you guys enjoy the Quran, a book which claims to be guidance for all people in all ages, contains the utterly useless command to not overstay your welcome at Muhammad's dinner party because he's too shy to tell you himself. But thankfully, Allah isn't shy like that. So let me get this straight. Just because Muhammad وسلم, doesn't want people to enter his house without his permission, then that automatically means that his revelations are fake or that he is hiding something from them. This is a clear unwanted assumption fallacy because you are assuming that this was the reason why Muhammad وسلم, doesn't want people to enter his house. I mean, would you want some random people to enter your house uninvited? No? Exactly. That's what I thought. After Muhammad got caught having sex with his slave girl, despite having numerous wives whom he supposedly visited all in the same night, he made a promise to his angry wives that he would stop. That is, until Allah rebuked him for making the oath. Hmm, I see that you're spouting lies just like your ancestor Paul. But hey, let me educate you real quick. This is the hadith he is talking about, Sahih Bukhari 5068. And nowhere in this hadith does Muhammad has sex with his slaves. All this hadith talks about is him having sexual relationships with his wives, which is totally permissible. I don't know why you have a problem with this. And also you are caught lying again. Surah An-Nisa actually states, nisa. Men are the caretakers of women. Nowhere does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rebuke Muhammad sallallahu All this verse talks about is basic patriarchal value. Muslim men are limited to four wives, but not Muhammad. He gets as many as he wants, thanks to a special decree of Allah. Yes, that is true. And why do you have a problem with that? The last time I checked, Muhammad وسلم, was a prophet of God. None of us are prophets of God. We are simply slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who are supposed to worship him. We do not have the same rights that the prophets had. Let me ask you this. You're a Christian, right? And you believe that Jesus, peace be upon him, walked on water and that he rose from the dead. Okay, then using your logic, why can't we rise from the dead? Oh, I know why. Because prophets are different from humans. So I really don't know why do you have a problem with him having more wives. I mean, I get that you're jealous, but I mean, come on, man, don't, don't make it so obvious. Speaking of Muhammad's wives, when two of them shared his secrets with each other, Allah revealed a threat saying they could be replaced in his eternal word. Man, Paul must be really proud of you. Why? Because you are caught lying again. All this verse talks about is how the disbelievers arrogantly rejected the message of Muhammad wasallam. Nowhere does it talk about Allah threatening Muhammad wasallam. So I suggest next time you actually read the verse you are citing. 
And then there's Muhammad's wife, Sada. When she grew old, she feared Muhammad would divorce her. So she cut a deal, allowing Muhammad to spend more time with Aisha. Allah endorsed the deal by sending down Surah 4, 128. And just to be sure everyone knew it was okay, Allah added 3351 as well. Yes, this is true. And what is your problem with this? Surah 4, 128 does talk about women fearing the loss of their husband, which is completely natural. I don't know why you have a problem with this. And same goes for this surah. Where again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ar-Rijalu kawwamuna ala nisa Men are the caretakers of women. I don't know why you have a problem with basic patriarchy. And I don't know why you think that just because Islam allows patriarchy, then that automatically necessitates that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not a true prophet of God. What? This doesn't make any sense whatsoever. A lot of religions, including Hinduism and your Christianity, do not condemn patriarchy. So why not condemn Christianity? Why only go after Islam? Like, is it your personal hatred or a personal bias or something like that? And who can forget Zainab, the beautiful wife of Muhammad's adopted son? No, or should I say ex-wife? After Muhammad saw her scantily clothed, he desired her. Zainab's husband, Zayd, offered to divorce her. But Muhammad said no. Then, mysteriously, Allah corrected him with the bizarre excuse that this was done to solve the non-existent problem of people wondering if it was lawful to marry their adopted sons, ex-wives. Open challenge to all the 2.6 billion Christians in the world. Find me one authentic hadith where it says that Muhammad wasallam fell in love with Zayd Rasulullah's wife after seeing her in private. This is yet another lie made by you because there is not a single authentic hadith where this specific story is mentioned. However, this verse in the Quran is talking about Muhammad وسلم, marrying Zayd Rasulullah's wife after Zayd Rasulullah divorced her. So again, I don't see what problems you have with this verse. And what do you mean by the non-existent problem? This was a problem at that time. People didn't know if this was permissible or not. Did you even study the life of Muhammad وسلم, or did you just come to the table with absolutely no knowledge whatsoever? Multiple hadith claim Muhammad loved women and perfume above all else, while well, at least one adds food as well. I don't know about you, but that sure sounds more like a hedonist than a prophet to me. Which brings us to our next category, the gross immorality of Muhammad. While immorality doesn't necessarily invalidate a claim to prophethood, it certainly invalidates the Islamic belief that Muhammad is the perfect example for all humanity to follow. Again, what is your problem with this? Yes, in this hadith, Muhammad وسلم, does say that women and perfume are dear to him. And please, use your amazing Christianity logic to prove to me how this means that he was not a prophet of God. Wait a minute, you just admitted that this doesn't mean that he is not a prophet of God. But you did say that this means that he is immoral. Um, please explain to me how loving women and perfume is immoral. You don't have any objective standard to say what is moral or what is immoral. Because even in your Bible, nowhere is this act condemned. To be honest, you sound more like a liberal than a Christian because you are using these liberal secular values to determine what is moral and what is immoral instead of using your Christianity values. <sighs> I'm sad to see that this is what your Christian values means to you. So yes, you are right. Muhammad wasallam is the best example for all humans to follow. And if you don't feel comfortable with some of his acts or teachings, then Tell me this, is this Islam's fault or is this your fault for feeling uncomfortable? Exactly, it's your fault. Now let's move on to the next very horrible argument. 
After Muhammad and his small band of followers moved to Medina in 622, they faced a problem. Where were they going to get income from? Muhammad's solution? Raiding unarmed trade caravans and taking their stuff. The plan proved successful, and Muhammad used the same basic model to spread Islam, promising war booty, or ganama, in exchange for fighting. War booty wasn't the only way Muhammad kept people in Islam, however, as he was not above bribery. Now just watch how I absolutely destroy all of these three reasons at one time. Okay, first of all, most of these reasons are just lies. In 622, Muhammad migrated to Medina along with his companions because they were promised freedom to practice their religion in Medina. And there were actually people in Medina who wanted to assassinate Muhammad So Muhammad was not the one causing the danger. He was the one in danger. Funny how you're trying to tilt the entire situation. Typical lying Christian missionary. And also regarding the Bukhari hadith. This hadith doesn't talk about bribery. All it talks about is Muhammad giving gifts to the people. And Amr bin Taglib actually accepted these gifts and said, quote unquote, the statement of Allah's apostle is dear to, dearer to me than my red camels. So please mention the bribery part again because I can't seem to find it. And speaking of greed, a man named Kiana knew where a certain treasure was hidden. Muhammad wanted it. So he gave the order. Torture him until you extract what he has. A fire was lit on Kiana's chest and eventually he was killed. Sadly, Muhammad never did learn where that treasure was. Yeah, no, this is fake news and this is absolutely false. In fact, if you would have actually studied the life of Muhammad you would know that one time Abu Talib the uncle of Muhammad actually advised Muhammad to stop giving dawah because it could have seriously put both of their lives in danger. And this is what Muhammad said to him. Oh my uncle. If they place the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left hand to cause me to renounce my task, aka giving dawa, verily, I would not desist therefrom until Allah made manifest his cause or I perished in the attempt. This is evidence to show that Muhammad was 100% dedicated to his task of giving dawah. So it would not make sense for him to suddenly start seeking treasure and the pleasures of this dunya considering the fact that the moment he saw Israfil with, with the trumpet then at that time alone all of his love for the dunya was taken away. So it really does not make any sense for him to just fall for some treasure. So yes, this is a hoax and a fake story. War booty wasn't the only thing Muhammad's soldiers got. When his men were apart from their wives and feeling horny, Muhammad said, Don't worry, you can have sex with all the captive women you want. This is actually called concubinage. Now, concubinage is a practice within multiple religions such as Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, and even Christianity. So why not condemn all of those religions? Why not say all of those religions are false? Or again, is it your personal bias against Islam? Solomon, peace be upon him, also had 300 concubines so why not condemn him david peace be upon him also had concubines so why not condemn him in conclusion if you are going to attack muhammad wasallam, for taking concubines then you also have to attack christianity for allowing concubinage this is yet another emotional non-argument against islam Alternatively, soldiers were given the option of doing muta, that is, paying a woman for a brief marriage, or what anyone else would call prostitution. 
the amount of context you are leaving behind is shocking. Because if you would have actually read Bukhari 4615, then you would know that all this hadith is talking about is the time when the companions of Muhammad wasallam were about to go into war. And at this time, they didn't have any wives with them. So this is the only time Muhammad wasallam allowed his companions to temporarily marry a woman aka muta marriage nowhere in any authentic hadith or the quran does it say that muta marriage is permissible and should be a practice under sharia law this was only a one time case which was allowed for the companions of muhammad to add more to this if you would have actually read any further then you would know that it says O oh, you who believe, do not make unlawful the good things which Allah has made lawful for you. The good things meaning the temporary mut'a marriage which is allowed in this case. And we should not make this unlawful by treating these temporary women as our wives. So yes, in conclusion, this was only a one-time thing and is not a practice within Islam. I can't even fathom how you could compare something like mut'a marriage do something as disgusting as prostitution. But hey, looks like Christians really do have a dirty mind. But wait, didn't Muhammad elevate the status of women? Nah, apparently not. A woman was beat by her husband until her skin turned green, which caused Aisha, Muhammad's child bride, to remark, I have not seen any woman suffering as much as the believing woman. Muhammad's response? She deserved it for speaking ill of her husband. Leaving behind context again, I see. Don't worry, let me read the hadith for you. In this hadith, we can see that a lady who quote-unquote got beaten was actually lying. It was actually the lady who wanted to go back to her old husband, so she lied. I suggest next time you actually read the hadith you are citing. He also claimed women were deficient in religion and intelligence, by the way. When a follower killed a woman in front of her child for making fun of Muhammad, he declared that nothing wrong had occurred. Yes, in Bukhari 304, Muhammad does say that women are deficient in their religion. And this is simply because Islam does not support the idea of feminism. It supports the idea of patriarchy, which means that men have authority over women. And this hadith is actually true. Females in general are extremely manipulative. And notice how Muhammad wasallam didn't say that all women will be in hell. He will say only the majority will be in hell. And the reason he said that was because we can clearly see nowadays that a majority of the women are falling into degeneracy. The only women who will enter paradise are the Muslim women who stood by their deen. This is why Muhammad wasallam in this hadith asked those women to give to the poor so that they could enter paradise. So this is actually a good act done by him, not a bad act. And also regarding Sunan Abu Daud 4361. Basically this hadith talks about a woman who used to hate on the Prophet Muhammad She used to insult him throw a lot of disgusting things at him and basically did a lot of vile things and her companion actually rebuked her multiple times and told her not to do this he rebuked her so many times but she did not listen so one day he took a dagger and then he killed her with it and also just so you know muhammad didn't say that this was a okay all he said that there was no payment which should be done on this action. I mean, use your brain for a second. The woman was given multiple warnings not to do this, but she still did it. So, answer this. Was it Muhammad's fault for not charging her companion with a crime? Or was it the woman's fault for not listening multiple and multiple times? Which is hardly surprising, since Muhammad ordered the execution of a hundred-year-old poet who mocked him, a slave girl who wrote satirical songs about him, 
and many other critics. Open challenge. Find me one story where this happens. Speaking of slaves, Muhammad bought, sold, and traded slaves, including black Africans, incidentally, as a form of currency. Muhammad even rebuked a man who freed six slaves at the time of his death and forced four of them back into slavery. So in Muslim 1602, a slave came to Muhammad وسلم, and the master of that slave demanded him back. So in order to free him, Muhammad وسلم, bought him in order to free him from his cruel master. So in a way, he actually freed the slaves. So I don't know why you're trying to portray him as a evil individual. Same goes for Bukhari 2141, where Muhammad was sold a slave to another master because his previous master wanted him to be freed at no time. So in both of these narrations, he basically freed the slaves, yet reason the answers over here is trying to change the context and is trying to portray Muhammad as the evil individual in this case. And lastly, Muslim 1668a just talks about the passing of an individual who had six slaves. So all Muhammad did was that he divided them into three sections. He set two of them free, meaning four were still kept in slavery. And I don't know why you have a problem with that considering the fact that in Islam, it is actually haram to even slap a slave. But for some reason, reasoned answers over here is scared for what would happen to these slaves, even though harming them is haram. So yet again, this is another emotional non-argument against Islam and does not prove that Muhammad Wasallam was either immoral or a false prophet. And no discussion of Muhammad's immoral actions is complete without mentioning his favorite wife. At the ripe young age of 50, Muhammad married the six-year-old Aisha. But don't worry, he waited until she was nine to rape her. Yes, rape. A nine-year-old cannot possibly give informed consent for sex. Yeah, Miski, not this horrible argument again. <sighs> well, even though I made a video three weeks ago explaining this marriage, I'm just going to explain it again in more simpler terms this time. Okay, first of all, you can't objectively prove to me that child marriage is wrong. And also, you use the word rape, which is incorrect. And you try to back up that claim by saying a nine-year-old cannot consent. Well, guess what? This isn't the 21st century we are talking about. We are talking about 600 or 500 AD, which was like 1,400 years ago from now. The age of consent at that time was different from today's age of consent. In fact, Aisha Razalatala herself said that when a girl reaches the age of 9, then she has become a woman. Or in other words, she has reached puberty. So no, Aisha Razalatala was a woman, not a child. Even for argument's sake, even if we do say that she was a child, yet again, you cannot objectively prove to me how this marriage was wrong. Honestly, I have refuted this argument so many times that it's just getting boring at this point. The same case is with you, David Wood and Apos. Like, do all of you like share the same arguments or not? Because this is just getting boring. Give me something new. A step up, we go from immoral actions of Muhammad to immoral actions of his sock puppet god. As we've seen, Allah has space in his eternal word for Muhammad's dinner parties and commands for him to marry the ex-wife of his adopted son. But do you know what Allah didn't have space for? Any condemnation of rape. In fact, he encouraged it giving men permission to have sex with the women their right hand possesses. That is, war captives and slaves, in addition to their four wives. 
We already went over this. This is called concubinage and this is an act practiced in Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism and Christianity. So what is your problem with it again? But should we really be surprised? After all, Allah describes women as fields for their husbands to plow when and how they please. Literally all this verse says is that we can do whatever we want with our wives and not incur Allah's wrath. Meaning we cannot literally do everything with our wives. We can only do that which is permissible. And beating up your wife for no reason is not permissible. So I don't know why you have a problem with this verse. Likewise, Muslim men are given permission to beat their wives if they merely fear disobedience. This is actually called spousal discipline and it is a practice within Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism and Christianity. So again, I don't know why you have a problem with this verse. And also, just so you know, Muslim men aren't allowed to beat their wives over extremely small issues. This is only permissible when the wife is about to do something which is genuinely bad for her and she is not listening to her husband. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't even tell us to beat them. He just tells us to strike them. And it said in Sunan Ibn Majah 1851 that this striking should be done without causing an injury or even leaving a mark. So yes, we are not allowed to beat them, we are allowed to strike them once. And even that is only in a case when the wife is about to do something which is genuinely bad for her. And this striking should be done without leaving a mark. So let me ask you this. What is your problem with this? And how old are those wives? The Quran gives no minimum age, but makes it clear that prepubescent marriage is permitted. Yes, the Quran does permit child marriage. And what is your problem with this? Child marriage is actually a good thing. Especially nowadays, we can see that a lot of teens are fornicating and this is causing a lot of damage to our society. So the only option to satisfy the desires of those teens is to get married. In fact, let me give you two hypotheses and you tell me which one is more moral. The first hypothesis is a six-year-old girl gets married to a 40-year-old man and both of those people live a happy life. The second hypothesis is two teens fornicate whenever they want and no one knows that that's happening. Now you tell me which one is more moral. Exactly. Unless there be any doubt about women's status in Islam, don't forget that men are promised big-breasted, eternally virgin horries in paradise. Women, of course, don't get any similar privilege. Yes, Muslim men will get 72 whores in Jannah. You all know why? Because men desire women. Shocking, I know. I mean, I get that you're jealous, but I mean, you don't have to make it so obvious, man. And it actually says that in Jannah, women will get something no eyes have ever seen, no ears have ever heard, or no tongue have ever spoken of. So if anything, the woman might get something better than what the men will get. So yes, this basically deconstructs your whole terrible argument. Enough on sex and sexism. Let's look at violence in the Quran. Muslims are commanded to fight Jews and Christians until they either convert or pay the jizya and feel themselves subjugated. Surah 9 verse 29 just talks about those Christians and Jews who wanted to kill the Prophet Muhammad wasallam at that time. It's not talking about literally any Christian, Jew or disbeliever in general. In fact, the Quran actually tells us 
to respect Christians and to make peace treaties with those Christians and Jews who did not wrong us in any way. So yep, this basically destroys your whole argument. In comparison to others though, that's a privilege. Muslims are commanded to kill the polytheists wherever you find them. Nope. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't tell us to literally kill every single polytheist. Yet again, you are leaving behind a lot of context. The beginning of this verse says, but when the sacred months expire. Now, if you don't know that at that time there were specific sacred months and in these sacred months, fighting in wars was prohibited. It was only after these sacred months expired that the fighting would begin again. So all this Quranic verse is talking about is the war which was going on at that time. It doesn't tell us to kill every single polytheist. It's just talking about a specific war at a specific time. In fact, for argument's sake, even if we do say that it is telling us to kill every single polytheist, then you as a Christian should not have a problem with that. Why? Because in your Bible, Jesus actually destroyed the temple of the polytheist. He flipped over the tables, whipped the men, women and children and made an entire temper tantrum. So yes, even if the Quran were to tell us to kill literally every single polytheist, then you as a Christian should not have any problem with that. And why is that justified? Because disbelievers are the worst of all creatures. Yup, disbelievers like you, David Wood, Apos and all of these other Christian missionaries and ignorant Hindus and Kafirs who openly reject the message of Islam, yes, they are the worst of creatures. We Muslims have no shame in saying this. If that isn't bad enough, a Muslim is permitted to kill a child if it is feared the child will grow up to be a disbeliever. But only if all it makes one do it, of course. This is actually an entire story in the Quran and it seems clear to me that you are leaving a lot of context behind again. So this story is basically about Moses peace be upon him. Now Moses peace be upon him met a man who would do certain actions but no one could explain his actions. And the only reason he killed that boy was because he knew that that boy was going to become a kafir when he grew up. And how did he know that? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him. So no, we Muslims are not allowed to kill any child just because we have a specific fear inside of us that tells us that he is going to grow up to be a disbeliever. This was only a one-time case for this specific man alone. Since Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the ability to see things like this. So yes, next time, don't leave any context behind. It makes you look like a liar, just like Paul. Which brings us to some deficiencies of Allah himself. It seems this sock puppet has a few holes in it. Allah causes some people to obey and others to disobey. He does not grant anyone free will. Actually, this verse says, Allah leaves whoever he wills to astray and guides whoever he wills. So no, we humans do have free will. But if a person has already heard the message of Islam, the true message of Islam, and still rejected it, then yes, he will be continue to go astray and he will enter the hellfire. Whereas, even if a disbeliever has certain doubts but eventually finds Islam, then he will go to heaven. In the end, all this verse talks about is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides whoever he wants to guide and does not guide whoever he does not want to guide. So if you want to be one of the people who Allah wants to guide, 
then you should start asking for guidance instead of rejecting the truth. Allah is not all loving. Indeed, he does not love the unbelievers, the wrongdoers, the wasteful, transgressors, the treacherous, or the arrogant. This is in spite of the fact that he was the one that caused these actions to begin with. Yes, we Muslims do believe that God does not love everyone unconditionally. Because if God loved everyone unconditionally, then what would be the purpose of hellfire? Unless you think that hell is a loving place. I hope you don't think that, right? And no, these were not actions caused by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like I said, we humans do have free will. So these were actions caused by humans, not by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then, Allah just arbitrarily forgives whom he likes and punishes whom he likes. Yes, Allah does forgive whomever he wills and punishes whomever he wills. God does not love everyone unconditionally, but that doesn't change the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Ghaffar, meaning the all-forgiving. And whoever asks for his forgiveness will be forgiven. And whoever does not ask for his forgiveness and continues on the path of evil, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not forgive him and enter him into the hellfire. But that's not all. Allah will mercifully place the sins of Muslims on Jews and Christians on Judgment Day, and then presumably punish them accordingly. Yes, this is 100% true. And why do you have a problem with this? Christians are someone who worship a man. And what's even worse are the Christians who openly reject Islam to worship a man. For example, Christians like you and David would. So you tell me, are these the type of people who would enter paradise or hellfire? Indeed, human beings have no value in the sight of Allah. Some are created solely so Allah can make them go astray and then destroy them. That sure doesn't sound like a just God to me. Nope. All this verse talks about are the people who openly rejected the message of the prophets and called them liars. It's not talking about anyone else. And also, you said, quote-unquote, that does not sound like a just God to me. Well, I have only one thing to say to you. It doesn't matter what you think! In the Quran, Allah and his angels pray. The angels presumably pray to Allah, but who does he pray to? No one knows. Muslims try to claim the verse means send blessings, which just shifts the problem, making the angels gods. Nowhere in this verse does it say that Allah prays to someone. In fact, it quote-unquote says, He, meaning Allah, is the one who showers his blessings upon you, meaning the Prophet, peace be upon him. And the angels pray for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Let me ask you this. If I pray for my friend that he passes his exams, then does that make me God? Exactly. That's not how it works. Thus, your entire argument has been obliterated. Allah calls himself the greatest of all deceivers. An ironically true statement. I literally made an entire one minute video where I refuted this exact same argument. So I'm just going to repost that argument to refute you as well. At this point, I don't even think that you are serious. I think you are just trolling us. The verse says, in fact, they did not kill him, nor did they crucify him, but it appeared to them as if they did. Now, the verse doesn't say that Allah made it appear to them. It says, it was made to appear to them. And also, you seem to have a problem with God deceiving people. Well, guess what? In 2 Thessalonians 2.11, it says, God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false. 
your bible has no problem with god deluding people so why do you have a problem with islam man looks like your bible really does have no problem with god deceiving people so reason the answers now let me ask you why do you have a problem with that verse allah makes that boast while tricking people into believing jesus was crucified the verse says in fact they did not kill him nor did they crucify him but it appeared to them as if they did now the verse doesn't say that allah made it appear to them it says it was made to appear to them there is no way that i just used 159 seconds short of mine to refute two arguments of yours that is just embarrassing to be honest up next are some reasons to doubt that muhammad's prophethood came from god the non sock puppet one that is according to islamic tradition it all began when muhammad was hanging out in a cave and had an encounter where he was squeezed by an unknown force until he thought he would die that seems pretty demonic to me and muhammad agreed his initial impression was that he was possessed by a jinn obviously that would be his first expression do you have any idea how hard it was to receive a revelation from god in fact muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam's body used to get heavy and he used to have heavy headaches whenever he received the revelations this in fact shows that the revelations were from god but for some reason you think these are demonic again this is an unwarranted assumption fallacy since you are assuming that it's demonic based on your personal experience so yes not only is this argument fallacious but it's also not objective since it's based on your own subjective feelings because of this muhammad tried to commit suicide Later, when revelation stopped for a period, he again wanted to commit suicide. If you would have actually done your homework, then you would know that this specific part is narrated by Noman bin Rashid, who was literally criticized for producing weak hadith and for his lack of memory. So no, Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam never attempt, attempted suicide. This is a fake news. Later in his career, Muhammad was the victim of black magic that gave him delusional thoughts, a clear sign he was not protected from evil by God. So just because Satan tried to deceive Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam multiple times, then that somehow means that Allah subhanahu wa taala did not protect him from evil. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was a human being. He was also tempted by Satan multiple times but what matters is that he didn't fall for his temptations you see we muslims believe that god tests his prophets and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam by letting satan confuse him for a bit but of course since he was a man of god he did not fall for it and also i don't get how this nullifies his prophethood but continue meanwhile muhammad made several prophecies which have proven false for example he predicted the imminent end of the world saying a young boy then living would not be very old when the last hour came and elsewhere saying that no one would be living 100 years from then <sighs> tedious Context wasn't really your best thing now was it Sahih Muslim 2953A says if this young boy lives he may not grow very old till he would see the last hour coming to you the last hour in this context is not talking about the day of judgment the last hour in this context is talking about the last hour of this boy meaning the time when this boy will die so yes this is not a false prophecy now let's move on to your next argument now in sahih al bukhari 
Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam says, "Do you realize the importance of this night? Nobody present on the surface of the earth tonight will be living after the completion of 100 years from this night." He said, "Tonight." meaning it's talking about the generation of that specific time and this prophecy did end up coming true since no one from that generation lived a hundred years after Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said this i mean logically speaking a generation can only last till a hundred years now can it so yes both of these arguments presented by you were absolutely false and got debunked by me now let's move on to the next very terrible argument that you have to propose. And what about the odd death of Muhammad? In the Quran, Allah says that if Muhammad was giving false revelations, he would die by having his aorta cut. Then, as he was dying, Muhammad exclaimed, I feel as if my aorta is being cut. Kind of sounds like a deathbed confession to me. Sam Shimon literally presented the exact same argument and it got debunked by me in a short I made like three weeks ago. So let me just repost that short to debunk you as well. Muhammad made up something in our name. We grab him by the right hand, cut off his aorta, and there'd be none of you who could save him from us. I just gave you Sahih Bukhari, yeah. volume 5, book 59, hadith 713. Your prophet says to Aisha, from that poison food that I ate at Khaybar, the poison lingered in my blood for years, and now I feel the poison cutting off my aorta. But that's exactly what the Quran says would happen to Muhammad if he's a liar. Let me educate you real quick. Okay, so this is the verse he is talking about. It says, then severed his aorta. The Arabic word used for aorta over here is al-watin. And this is the hadith he is talking about. In this hadith, the Arabic word used for aorta is abhari. Now, as we can see, in the Quran, the Arabic word used for aorta was al-watin. But in the hadith, the Arabic word used for aorta was abhari. Since they don't have the same word used for aorta, you can say that the hadith is talking about aorta. Therefore, Muhammad, peace be upon him, is not a liar. So yes, that pretty much finishes your entire argument right there. So now let's move on to the next argument. Muhammad stated that bells are the instruments of the devil. He also stated that his revelation came with the sound of a bell. Another admission of his own fraudulent claims, perhaps? This is another unwarranted assumption fallacy. Since you are assuming that he was possessed by a specific demon just because he heard bells in his revelations. Please Thaddeus, for once can you actually present a non-fallacious argument? Speaking of Satan, at one point Muhammad revealed verses supporting polytheism. He later claimed that he had been tricked by Satan into doing so. Open challenge. Find me one authentic hadith in which Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam supports polytheism. Conveniently, this story, now known as the Satanic Verses, has been whitewashed from many later Muslim histories. Which brings us to the next set of reasons that Islam is false. Historical problems with the formation of Islam. In Islam, the deeper one dives, the shakier the history gets. The Satanic Versus incident is found in numerous texts, making it hard to deny historically. But attempts to wipe it from Islamic history reflect a common pattern. The earliest biographies of Muhammad have been lost. The earliest one extent to significant amount is that of Ibn Ishaq, more than a hundred years after the time of Muhammad. His work is preserved by Ibn Hassam, who edited it down and removed some of the controversial parts. This is not itself all that problematic. What is problematic is the work paints a very different, much more violent picture of Muhammad than Islam today claims. Yeah, that's cool and all, but where is the evidence for all of this? Where is the evidence that the Quran and the Hadith were whitewashed? Where is the evidence that the earlier manuscripts could not have been found? And also, yes, Ibn Ishaq was the first person to write about the life of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and yes this was written over a hundred years after Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam's death but the thing is that Ibn Ishaq 
actually collected manuscripts and authentic chain of transmissions which dated back to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam's life which means that there is absolutely nothing wrong with the life which is presented today and also you as a christian should not have any problem with this considering the fact that your bible was compiled 500 years after the death of jesus peace be upon him so this is actually a kind of a hypocrisy on your side Muslims now reject Ibn Ishaq and instead rely on hadith collections which were compiled 200 or more years after Muhammad died historically speaking this is a huge problem as the earliest sources are rejected in favor of later ones which have had much more time to be sanitized no we muslims do not reject ibn ishaq and we do not reject the hadith as well especially authentic hadiths which have a strong chain of narration so as long as the hadiths have strong trains of narrations which date back to the time of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam it quite literally doesn't matter if they are written 50 years later his death or 200 years after his death so where is the historical problem again muslim works aren't the only source of information however and several non muslim texts describing muhammad predate the earliest islamic texts these paint another picture of muhammad seeing him as a combination of military leader and claimed prophet of Christianity but never as the founder of a new religion so in which non-muslim source does it say that muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was the founder of christianity and also if you would have actually read the life of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam then you would know that sometime later he did became the head of state This isn't something new to us Muslims. He was the last prophet of God and he was the head of state at the same time. Like is that so hard for you to comprehend or what? Then there is the Quran itself. It paints a picture of an end times prophet who thought the world was about to end. Furthermore, the prophet seems to think he was sent only to the Arabs, not to all of humanity. Nope. The message that Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam brought was for the whole of humanity, not for a specific group of people. Seriously, like where are you getting all of this information from? Like you are not even giving any evidence for these specific claims and the Quran verses which you are showing do not say anything about this. So, where are you getting these false informations from? That's four sources of possible information about Muhammad and four different pictures painted none of which match modern muslim claims about Muhammad what should we believe let's see what we are supposed to believe is one muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was the last prophet of god two he was the head of state Three, his message was for the whole of humanity, and four, we have authentic chains of transmissions which go back to his time. So please tell me where are these so-called made-up historical problems which you are keep blabbering about? Speaking of whitewashed history, what's the deal with Mecca? Islamic tradition says it's the oldest city in the world. that it was a great trade capital before Muhammad's time however there's no concrete evidence physical or documentary that it even existed before the 7th century if you ever need evidence that this guy knows absolutely nothing about the life of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam then this specific clip is what you need Like I said the life of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is known to us Muslims because we have manuscripts and authentic chain of transmissions which goes back to his time so meaning the Ibn Ishaq book is actually 100% authentic meaning that is concrete evidence And what does the life of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam say? Well, if we actually read his life then we will know that Makkah was actually a satanic society before Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the Kaaba 
was used to worship polytheistic gods. It is only after the arrival of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam that Mecca became the most holy city in the entire world. So the fact that we have entire manuscripts and authentic chain of transmissions which go back to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam's time that alone is concrete evidence to show that his life and the biography is 100% authentic and that Makkah really did exist before Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam's time Every mosque is supposed to point to Mecca, but when we look at the earliest ones, they seem to point instead to Petra. Mecca is mentioned only once in the Quran by name. The geography described is compatible with an Islamic origin in either Petra or in Yemen, but definitely not compatible with the present-day location of Mecca. Who said that every mosque was supposed to point towards Mecca? Every prayer should be done towards Mecca. Not every mosque should be pointed towards Mecca. There are multiple mosques who point to other places and there is nothing wrong with that. And also, nowhere in this verse does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describe the description of Mecca to that of Pentra. Seems like you are lying again. Then there's the Quran itself. The Quran is supposed to be the eternal word of Allah, in existence from before the foundation of the earth, giving guidance to all people in all ages. Yet, when we take a close look, it appears it was written in the 7th century for 7th century people. For example, it repeatedly says, remember such and such, and then gives minimal details, or no details at all. It seems to expect the audience to already know the story. This is yet another unwarranted assumption fallacy. Because you are assuming that the Quran did not exist before the 7th century just because it did not give us the maximum details that we need to know about the past. And also, why would the Quran even do that in the first place? The Quran is not here to tell us about the past. The Quran is here to tell us about on how we can live our lives. So this argument makes no sense whatsoever. Which makes perfect sense, given that the evidence of the author or authors of the Quran were in fact repeating well-known stories, not personal revelation. The Quran itself contains the accusation that Muhammad was merely copying tales of the ancients several times. Literally all these verses talk about the disbelievers who thought that the Quran were copied from ancient fables. There is no actual historical evidence which proves to us that the Quran actually did copy ancient fables. These were just mainly claims of ignorant kafirs and polytheists at that time. Likewise, Surah 16, 103 contains an accusation that Muhammad has a human teacher and then gives the ridiculous defense that the teacher is of a foreign tongue. Apparently, the eternal word of Allah knew the specific person who people were going to say Muhammad was getting information from and had this defense ready for all of eternity. But the defense is idiotic. Human language can be translated. So in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the disbelievers who make the claim that the one who is teaching Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a human. But the only problem was that the human they refer to spoke in a foreign tongue, whereas the Quran is in Arabic. And also, you claim that human language can be translated, so that automatically means that the person who spoke the foreign tongue translated the Quran into Arabic. This is false, because like I said, we have manuscripts and authentic chain of transmissions which go back to the time of Muhammad wasallam. So it would be idiotic to claim that the Quran is a translation of another foreign language. And also because there is no real historical evidence for this. Furthermore, the defense states the Quran is pure Arabic, when in fact it contains many foreign loanwords. 
Modern Muslims will say the accusation of copying is false, that the Quran was correcting corrupted copies of previous revelation. Note first that the Quran itself contains no such claim. It merely asserts the accusers are wrong in most places, or, as we saw, makes lame and valid defenses. First of all, no, the Quran never claimed that it was written in pure Arabic. The verse says that the Quran was written in eloquent Arabic, meaning fluent Arabic, and this is true. And even if the Quran did claim that it was purely written in Arabic, find me one, just one foreign word that is used in the Quran. And also, yes, the Quran is here to correct the mistakes the previous scriptures made or humans made to the previous scriptures. Literally your whole argument cannot be backed up by anything. There is no historical evidence that the Quran was translated into Arabic from some foreign language. These are just mere assumptions made by you, a critic of Islam. It seems Muslims know better than their God, but it gets worse. The Quran actually copies very little from the Bible but instead copies from Midrash, Jewish commentaries on the scripture. This is actually called the post hoc fallacy. Just because B comes after A doesn't necessitate that B came from A. Similarly, just because the Quran came after the Jewish scripture and the Bible doesn't necessitate that the Quran copied from these specific scriptures. And also, answer this, if the Quran copied from the Bible and the Torah, then why didn't it copy the mistakes? And that's not all it copies. It also copies later legends such as the Seven Sleepers that were never considered scripture by anyone. Like I said, post hoc fallacy. There is no way you just made two arguments and both of these arguments got refuted by the same fallacy. Bro, can for once your argument be, I don't know, not fallacious? It even borrows a pagan tale of Alexander the Great, named Dulcarnain in the Quran, where he travels to the ends of the earth and passes it off as fact. Again, post hoc fallacy. There is no way you just made three arguments and all of those three arguments got refuted by one fallacy. And also, logically speaking, the story of Dulcarnain could not have been copied from the story of Alexander the Great. In Alexander's story, he wanted to conquer the whole world, but he died in a banquet. Whereas the story of Zulkarnain is that he was the one who created the wall which is holding behind the Yajuj and Majuj. Literally, both of these stories differ so much, I don't even know how you could even come to the conclusion that it copied from one another. I mean, I get that you don't know anything about Islam, but you also don't know anything about history. Sad, to be honest. Which brings us to the many historical and scientific errors of the Quran. Remember, the Quran is supposed to be the literal speech of God, so it should be error-free. Instead, we find very little that's accurate. In the aforementioned tale of Dual Karnain, the hero travels so far west that he comes to the place where the sun sets. What does he find? The sun sets in a muddy pool of water. Yeah, not so fast. This verse says, until he reached the setting point of the sun which appeared to him to be setting in a spring of murky water. Now, this verse doesn't say that the sun literally set in a muddy pool of water. All it says is that that is the way it appeared to Zulkurnayn. So yes, this was not an error in the Quran. It's mainly talking about how it appeared to Zulkarnain. And Zulkarnain was tired since he was traveling the entire earth. So yes, this verse is error free. Then he travels so far east that he comes to the place where the sun rises. And he finds a people without protection from the intense light. These descriptions only make sense if the earth is flat and the sun is much smaller than the earth. So let me get this straight. The sun was rising and its rays were hitting on the people's faces who were not covered. Yet this somehow necessitates that the earth is flat and the sun is smaller than the earth. This argument makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. 
Speaking of a flat earth, the Quran states or implies just that many times. Now guys, just to wait and watch how I absolutely destroy all of these pathetic arguments. This is the first verse he cited. And nowhere in this verse does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala imply that the earth we are living on is a flat earth. This is the second verse he cited. And in this verse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, As for the earth, we have stretched it out and have cast on it firm mountains. Stretched out doesn't mean flat. And even if it did, this is a clear metaphorical statement made by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It refers to the earth being huge and have a large area. This is the third verse he cited. And in this verse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, The one who made for you the earth as a bed. This is a clear metaphorical statement. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not literally mean that the earth has the same structure as a bed. It just says that the earth is made as a bed, meaning it's a place for us to lie down on. And this is true. Same goes for this verse. It is said in a metaphorical statement that the earth is like a cradle, meaning it's a place for us to rest on. Like, do you take everything literally or what? This is the fifth verse he cited. And in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, We have spread out the earth and have set upon it firm mountains. Spread out doesn't mean flat. Flat means having a level surface without raised areas. Whereas spread out means something which is placed over a large area. As we can see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used the word spread out, not flat. And as we see, these two words have two completely different meanings. Same goes for this verse and this verse. This is the eighth verse he cited. And the same goes for this verse. It is a metaphor. It says like a bed, meaning it is a simile, a metaphor. Do you not understand what a metaphor is? And the spread out argument goes for both of these verses. So yes, all of these arguments about the Quran supposedly claiming that the earth is flat is wrong. You just got debunked. The sky, meanwhile, is apparently in a solid object that will fall on the people if Allah doesn't hold it up. This conception of the sky is supported by reference to invisible pillars. This is actually a miraculous thing, not something which is an error. Yes, we Muslims do believe that there are invisible pillars which Allah is using to hold up the sky. However, this is a miraculous claim which can't be proven or disproven via science. And as a Christian, why do you have a problem with miracles? Don't you believe that Jesus rose from the dead? What hypocrisy is this? Likewise, the perfectly clear Quran strongly implies geocentrism. Geocentrism was a theory which stated that the earth was in the center of the universe. Now obviously this theory was wrong and scientifically illogical, but where in the Quran does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala support the theory of geocentrism? Oh wait, you think that the Quran supports it by looking at these verses. In these verses, all Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about is the basic day and night cycle. Nowhere does he say that the earth is at the center of the universe. So this argument of Islam supporting geocentrism is false. Stars are then tiny objects in the lowest heaven. Yes, this is true. The stars are really tiny objects compared to the rest of the heavens. You see, we Muslims believe that we are living in the lowest heaven right now, which is this universe. And all the heavens that come after this one are bigger than this specific one. So compared to all of those heavens, yes, the stars that we have are thin and tiny objects. Allah uses these stars as defensive missiles against jinn trying to sneak into heaven. This is a miraculous event that can't be proven or disproven via science. So no, this is not an error in the Quran. This is simply a miracle. And the last time I checked, you Christians also believe in miracles. So you should not have a problem with this. 
When you see a shooting star, which is of course not actually a star, this is proof of the Quranic claim, at least according to its best interpreter, Muhammad. The context of this hadith is that one night, the companions of Muhammad وسلم, saw a meteor going by, and they thought that this meteor meant that a great person has died or a great person has born. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala messenger Muhammad وسلم, disagreed with this and said that this is false. These meteors are just rocks which the angels throw to the jinns who snatch the heavenly information. Like I said, miraculous event. The Quran falsely claims sperm comes from between the backbone and the ribs. So these are the verses he is talking about. The last verse says, stemming from between the backbone and the ribcage. The word translated for stemming or emerging is yakhruju. Now, there are two classical understandings of the word yakhruju, both of which disprove this being a specific scientific error. The first understanding is that the word yakhruju is referring to the spurting fluid, which we would understand to be the seminal fluid. For those who don't know, the seminal fluid does not primarily come from the testicles, but in the seminal vesicles, which are in the abdomen of the male. And the second understanding is a common belief which is held by the ulama. And that understanding is that the word yakhruju is referring to the man being created, meaning it is talking about childbirth. Both of these understandings are considered to be valid and oppose it being a specific scientific error. It claims human beings begin as a drop of blood. It claims all living things come in gendered pairs, having no knowledge of asexual reproduction. Yes, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does say that he created human beings from a clot of blood. And why do you believe this to be false? You as a Christian believe that God created Adam, peace be upon him, from clay. So again, why do you have a problem with this? And how does this disprove Islam exactly? And yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did create everything in pairs. For example, there are two genders, male and female. Are you a liberal who believes that there are more than two genders? If so, that doesn't really look good on your Christian profile. All animals live in communities, according to Allah. But sadly, that one's false as well. Nope, it is not false. Animals are also in certain communities like us human beings. For example, wolves do have a community or a pact, as you can say. Birds as well and many other animals as well. These are all communities of animals. So no, this verse is not an error of the Quran. It is absolutely correct. Allah confuses Mary, the sister of Aaron and Moses, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, two women who lived more than 1,000 years apart. No, Mary al-Islam was the sister of Aaron. Your whole source of information of them being two different people is the Bible. And we Muslims believe that the current day Bible is corrupted. So why are you using something which is in the Bible and comparing it to something which is in the Quran? Speaking of Mary, Allah seems to think Christians take her as part of the Trinity. And never once condemns the actual belief of the Christian Trinity. Yeah, no, nowhere in this verse does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say that Maryam, peace be upon her, was a part of the Trinity. This verse is simply talking about a conversation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will have with Jesus, peace be upon him, on the day of judgment. And in it, he asks Jesus, peace be upon him, Jesus, son of Mary, did you say to people, take me and my mother for gods beside Allah? And Jesus will obviously say no. Now, are there some people who worship Jesus? Yes, they are called Christians. And are there some people who worship Mary, peace be upon her? Yes, they are called Catholics. So no, this verse doesn't talk about the Trinity at all. The Quran also claims Jesus prophesies the coming of Ahmed by name, but there is no evidence of that. If you would have actually done your research, then you would know that Ahmad is just another variant for the name Muhammad. 
meaning in this verse jesus peace be upon him prophesied about muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam not some other prophet so yes next time you make a claim to your research the quran claims jews take ezra as the son of god in the same sense christians take jesus as the son of god but there's no solid evidence that anyone ever did that let alone large groups of jews Nope, Christians do believe that Jesus peace be upon him is the son of God and Jews do believe that Ezra is the son of God. What? You don't believe me? Well, if you would have actually studied the history, then you would know that Ezra was the religious leader of the Jews at that time and he was the one who reconstructed the Jewish community. So I don't see any reason to doubt that Jews would believe this man was the son of God. So I don't know what you're on about to be honest. Allah also claims John the Baptist was the first person given that name even though we know of many Johns before him. You see we Muslims believe that John was a prophet of God and we call him Yahya alayhi salam. You have to look at the context, the context in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that he had not assigned anyone before him this name. He is talking about any prophet before him. And this is true, there is not a single prophet before John that was named John. And what about the massive iron wall of Dulkarnain? It's supposed to exist until the day of judgment, yet it's nowhere to be found. Man, what is it with you and Zulkarnain? Anyways, we Muslims believe that the wall Zulkarnain created will be taken down on the day of judgment and you said that you can't find it, right? Well, again, this is a miraculous event and there are also many theories where Yajuj and Majuj can be located. So, thinking Islam is false just because you can't find the Yajuj Majuj wall is idiotic because who knows this wall may be invisible or a miracle so no this is another miraculous event and is not a scientific or historical error there are many more scientific and historic errors in the quran but i think that's enough let's move on to internal contradictions muslims will of course try to find ways to resolve these but remember the Quran supposedly has only one author, God himself, who is perfectly clear and explains himself in detail. So elaborate explanations shouldn't be needed to explain Allah's differing claims. Where is Allah? The Quran gives multiple answers and even Muslim scholars have been unable to solve the mystery disagreeing strongly among themselves. Yeah, no, there isn't a single Muslim scholar that actually had trouble answering this very simple question. In this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elaborates on his omnipresence and that wherever we pray, we pray towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, the main place where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala resides is his throne, which is located above the ocean and the ocean is above the seventh heaven. So in conclusion, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is omnipresent and wherever we pray, we pray towards him. But the place where he mainly resides is his throne. So yes, we Muslims don't have trouble answering this question like why are you lying? Does Allah lead people astray? No or not? Does Allah forgive all sins or are some too grave for forgiveness? To answer your first question, in this verse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the disbelievers and their hearts have been sealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Take you for example, you have so many reasons to believe that Islam is the true religion but you are still refusing and you made this video. So you are actually a perfect example of someone who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed a seal over. However, this isn't a permanent seal. You can obviously look into the Quran and convert to Islam. But as long as you don't do that, the seal is on your heart. And this verse actually backs that up. In this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah will never consider a people deviant after he has guided them. Meaning all you have to do to remove the seal from your heart is 
be ready for guidance. Whereas you clearly don't want guidance and are continuing to reject Islam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed a seal on your heart. But that seal could be removed if you just seek guidance. And to answer your second question, the only unforgivable sin is shirk, meaning associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, this sin is only unforgivable when someone dies right after doing this sin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive shirk if you repent. So yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-ghafar, meaning all-forgiving. Can people bear the burdens of others? or only their own sins. Yes, no soul will be burdened with the soul of another. But the disbelievers have to carry their own sins and the sins of all those other people they misled. So it's only an exception for disbelievers. Other than that, no, every soul shall bear their own burdens. How many days of creation were there? Six or eight? Or maybe it was just an instant. In total, there were only six days of creation. I'm pretty sure he created the earth and everything on it in two days. And on the other four days, he created the rest of the universe. But the Quran clearly says that Allah could have said be and originated everything. But Allah chose not to. So to answer your question, it took a total of six days to create the universe, but it could have been much shorter to be honest. What was man created from? The Quran gives no less than six different answers. Alright, so if we actually read these verses, then we can tell that these verses resemble a sort of a pattern. In these verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala either says that we are created from blood or from sperm or from water, or from nothing, or from mud. All of these claims are true because we humans are created from all of these things. So to answer your question of what was man created from, my answer will be that man was created from all of these things combined. Who was the first Muslim? Muhammad? Moses? Abraham? Or maybe it was a group of Egyptians. In these verses, all of these people did thought that they were the first of the believers. However, every Muslim knows that Adam salam, was the first believer. Just because these group of Egyptians or Moses peace be upon them or Abraham peace be upon them thought that they were the literally first Muslim ever to exist, then that does make it true because they are still human beings. Is alcohol permitted or forbidden? That last one, and some other contradictions on moral teaching, are solved by abrogation. The idea that Allah changed his commands over time sounds reasonable at first. At least if you imagine Allah slowly bringing along 7th century people. But then you remember that this is supposedly his eternal speech given multiple times to multiple different people groups, and the claim makes no sense at all. First of all, alcohol is 100% prohibited in Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it very clear in the Quran that any sort of intoxicants are forbidden, meaning haram. And also the verse you cited says, for whatever verse we might abrogate or consign to oblivion, we bring a better one or the like of it. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not change his verses. All Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about is that if he were to, then he were going to bring a better verse. So this is a sort of a hypothesis you can say, not an objective fact. Which brings us to our last category. Internal incoherence and logical errors of the Quran and Islamic beliefs. That's right, one need look no further than the Quran's own claims about itself. For any rational person to say, I'm smarter than this Allah fella, but I'm no god, so he ain't neither. Speaking of abrogation, most Muslims don't realize it, but Hadith can, and often do, abrogate the Quran. 
That's right, Muhammad's words can overrule all his eternal word. But doesn't that make Muhammad a god? Even though the Quran asserts he's only a warner over and over again? Yes, there are some hadiths out there which do contradict the Quran. But do you know what we call those hadiths? We call them weak hadiths or daif hadiths. And no one follows those hadiths. In fact, open challenge, find me one sahi, meaning authentic hadith, which goes against the Quran. Other times, Muslims simply forgot large portions of the Quran. But don't worry, that just means those verses were abrogated too. Indeed, even a tame sheep can abrogate verses when it eats the only copy of the text in question. Yeah, yeah we humans are not gods, we do forget sometimes. We humans do tend to forget things sometimes, but that doesn't change anything, we can still be reminded of it. And also, why do you have a problem with a sheep eating a piece of paper of the Quran? I mean, it's your Bible which has been ripped up multiple times and corrupted by authors over thousands of years. So this actually looks bad on you, not us Muslims. The Quran repeatedly states or implies it is confirming the Torah and Gospels, and that if people were following them, they would follow Muhammad too. But even Muslims will agree the Bible and the Quran teach very different things, but that makes the Quran's claims false. Oh God, this argument is getting so old. In the Quran, the Bible and the Torah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about is not the same as the Bible and the Torah which you guys have currently. In fact, take this verse for example. In this verse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, We gave him the Gospels, meaning this gospel was given to Jesus, peace be upon him, when he was alive. Whereas the gospels that you have nowadays were compiled 500 years after his quote-unquote death. The same goes for the Torah. The Torah which we have nowadays is full of contradictions and is not the same as the one which Moses, peace be upon him, had. So this basically destroys your whole argument. To avoid this, Muslims claim that the Bible has been corrupted. This defies the historic evidence and also means they are supposedly smarter than the God who never once mentions said corruption explicitly. Similarly, the Quran states several times that Muhammad is found in the Jewish and Christian scriptures. Sadly, the Quran doesn't cite any specifics, and so Muslims are left to guess where Muhammad is mentioned and they haven't been able to come up with anything remotely convincing. First of all, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not have to directly say in the Quran that the Bible and the Torah have been corrupted. Any rational person reading these two scriptures and seeing the hefty amount of contradictions which are in it can tell that it has been corrupted. And like I said, these are not the same gospel and not the same Torah as the one Moses and Jesus had. And also, again, like I said, Muhammad wasalam, is mentioned in the Bible and the Torah, but these Bible and the Torah were the originals, not the fake ones that you have today. Muslims believe Jesus was a Muslim prophet who attracted many Muslim followers. In the Quran, Allah promises that the true followers of Jesus will be superior over the unbelievers and remain that way until Judgment Day. However, the only followers of Jesus that have ever been superior in power or numbers are Christians. And Christians are definitely not Muslims. So either the Quran is wrong about who will become uppermost, or it is wrong about Jesus' followers being Muslims. Yeah, other fake news. First of all, Muslims are superior over Christians. Even in strength, we can see that Salahuddin won against Baldwin. Vlad got impaled by Muhammad II. And I could name so many other historical events where Muslims were stronger than Christians. However, the only problem is that this verse doesn't talk about literal and physical strength. It talks about who really follows Jesus. And we Muslims 
are the ones who really follow Jesus, not you Christians. And yes, we are superior to you in spirituality, that is. And on the Day of Judgment, we will be rewarded and you will be sent in the hellfire. This is how you Muslims are superior to Christians. Indeed, there's no evidence that Jesus ever had a single Muslim follower. Which brings us to the next problem. The Quran claims it sent a messenger to every nation. Yet 100% of the prophets before Muhammad that it knows about, unless we consider Alexander the Great a prophet, were sent to Israel. Furthermore, the verse says some in every nation are rightly guided by Allah. Yet, strangely, there's zero historic evidence of any messenger or any Muslim follower for any of the hundreds of nations that existed before Muhammad's time. And where is the evidence that Jesus' followers were Christians? The term Christianity was not even created by Jesus. It was created by Paul the liar. And also, most if not all of the things which Jesus, peace be upon him, taught are perfectly in line with Islamic teachings. Whereas, Jesus, peace be upon him, never told people to worship him. These were just claims made by Paul, who was a crook and a liar. And also, what do you mean by there's zero evidence that these prophets existed? Do you have any evidence that someone known as John existed, or someone known as Luke existed, or someone known as Matthew or Mark existed? This is so hypocritical of you. The Quran's primary proof of its own inspiration is the Surah Like It challenge. Unbelievers are challenged to produce something like the Quran. Supposedly, when they realize they can't do it, they'll be impressed and know the Quran is from God. There are many problems with this, starting with the fact the author of the Quran can't make up his mind on how many like surahs are required. Is it one surah? Ten surahs, or a whole book. So the challenge of the Quran is to produce anything like it. Now, what this means is that the challenge is for all of humanity, and this challenge is that we should make something like the Quran, meaning it's talking about the whole book. And also, I don't see how this disproves Islam. Then there's the problem that no clear criteria are given. Indeed, even Muslim scholars disagree about whether the challenge refers to the supposed beauty of the rhetoric or unparalleled teaching. In Muhammad's day, multiple people claimed to meet or exceed the challenge, saying their own poetry was better. Satan apparently tricked Muhammad himself into thinking his words were the Quran in the Satanic Verses incident. Modern challengers, likewise, have sometimes fooled many Muslims. In contrast, I have never heard of a single person converted to Islam by the challenge. Okay, first of all, like I said, the challenge is to produce anything like the Quran, meaning the whole book. It's not just talking about making up some verses similar to it. It's talking about a way of life like the Quran. And also, no, there is no evidence that people during the life of Muhammad wasalam, actually managed to destroy this challenge. And also, you said that you have never heard of anyone who converted because of the challenge, huh? Well, what about revered Muslim Ali Dawa? He himself said that the main reason he converted to Islam was because the Quran made this bold claim that no one can produce anything like it. Again, this argument doesn't really disprove Islam anyways. But most importantly, the challenge is simply invalid from the start. Even if the Quran is completely unique, that wouldn't make it from God. For such a claim to be true, every unique thing would have to come directly from God, which I don't think anyone would agree with. Then there's the Quran's other challenge. Then do they not reflect upon the Quran. If it had been from other than Allah, they would have found within it much contradiction. You do have to admire the confidence of Allah, leaving himself the escape hatch of much. 
First of all, no, the challenge is not invalid. If someone or a lot of people cannot come up with anything like the Quran, then isn't that clear-cut evidence that the Quran is not from any human? And also, yes, there are no contradictions in the Quran. Literally, every single quote-unquote contradiction that you brought up got debunked by me. Sorry to tell you that. Even ignoring that, Allah goofed up big time. Muslims tend to read the verse as if it said, If this contains much air, it is not from God. That statement would be alright, but it can only invalidate, not validate, the Quran, i.e. it is a negative challenge. That wasn't good enough for Allah, so he proposed a positive challenge instead. The problem is, it only works if it is always true that something without much air comes from God. That is obviously not true, meaning the verse itself is an error of logic, and the challenge is dead before it even begins. Ouch! Nowhere in the Quran does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say that just because the Quran does not have any contradiction, then that automatically necessitates that it's from God. The reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, quote unquote, if this book was not from God, then you would have found in it numerous contradictions. There is nothing invalid about this claim. Think about it. All the other scriptures such as the Bible, the Torah, the Vedas, the Bhagavad Gita, all of these scriptures have contradictions, contradictions in them. And the Quran is the only one which doesn't. This just shows that the Quran is different from all of these scriptures and it is from God. And even if you think that this is not a good source of evidence, well guess what, like I said, in 1400 years no one has produced anything like the Quran. So these two reasons should be enough for you to believe that it's from God, yet you keep denying it. Alright guys, these were all of these stupid hundred reasons. And let's see, these reasons were either verses or hadiths taken out of context, clear-cut lies, emotional non-arguments, or just fallacious arguments. Alhamdulillah, this just shows that there is not a single good argument against Islam out there. That's all for today guys, and until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.